Welcome to Brazil, the fifth largest country in the world and home to some of the finest examples of gemstones you're ever likely to see. Brazil's richly diverse landscape has been the ideal location for a variety of beautiful gemstones to slowly form beneath the earth. During this show, Steve Bennett takes you deep into the heart of southern Brazil to discover more about its vast gemstone wealth. Just arrived in southern Brazil. Can't actually get to uh, Amatista do Sol by plane uh, because it's in a very remote location. So uh, we've landed uh, in the state above and we've got a lot of journeys that we need to go on. After a long and arduous journey, the team finally arrive at their first location, a small, peaceful town named after the very gemstone found here, Amethyst. The actual mining takes place in uh, Rio Grande do Sol, uh, certainly here at Amethyst do Sol, about 35 metres below the uh, sur surface of the earth. Uh, it's that little ridge over there, you can see the little village that started to uh, uh, open up now where the miners are mining for the gemstone. But I'm going to take you inside the mine so you can see exactly how difficult it is to actually get out the amethyst. Amethyst mining in the south is very different to the north. In the north you'll find big, big crystals. In the south, it's always inside a geode. This is a, <laughs> it's an amazing event. Many millions of years ago, lava flowed over the southern Brazil uh, and, and trapped gas bubbles. In those gas bubbles over millions of years, we have a cocktail of elements. We get different minerals, different elements forming inside these big holes and, and creating the crystals and creating the amethyst. Then man, uh, over the last 20 years or so, has been mining down in these caves. You'll see here the drill holes, and at first, what they will do, because it takes a long time to carve out of the hillside, out of the mountain, out of this very, very hard rock, the actual geode. So what man will do first is he will drill inside the geode, and we'll have a look inside, have a look at the quality of the crystal, see what the color looks like, see what the clarity looks like. And then, and only then, if the quality is good, he'll actually extract the whole geode. It's very easy to get complacent about many, many gemstones, and certainly the citrines, the amethyst, the smoky quartz, the, the green amethyst. It's complacent because you see so much of it on the television. But when you come out of a mine and you realise how much work goes into taking out each and every gem, uh, geode, I've just had a go with a hammer, I've had a go with a jackhammer, and it can take days just to get one geode out. Then some of the gemstones inside that geode are good enough for setting into jewellery. Some are good enough uh, for keeping it as ornaments. Some we'll make into strands. But we get very, very complacent. But there's a big issue right now. Just like we've got issues in many countries where gemstones are getting harder to find, they are down to only 100 mines in this area in the southern part of Brazil. Now, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them many, many years ago. But again, it's another gemstone that we're finding harder and harder to get. So who knows, maybe in 10 years, 20 years time, there'll be less amethyst, maybe we'll be thinking about amethyst then, as maybe to do it today, we do tanzanite. Like amethyst, citrine is a member of the quartz family. But did you know that the citrine in your jewellery may have started out life as an amethyst? Although occasionally we can discover citrine naturally, normally most citrine, certainly out of Brazil, starts off life as amethyst. It's then put into an oven like this for around 12 hours, Slowly the temperature increases, increases up to 470 degrees, then they allow it to cool. Once they open the door, some pieces have turned a beautiful yellow colour, some haven't changed at all, some it turns the crystal completely white. We never know till we open the door exactly what we get out, but occasionally when you find that beautiful Brazilian citrine, the colour actually started off life as a little amethyst. One of the latest trends, and especially in the Chinese market, is to buy complete geodes. So if the amethyst inside a geode isn't quite gemstone quality, it can still be worthwhile for the miners to extract it. Marcel's actually banging each one of the, the stones, he's got a lot of experience, and he's listening to the, the, the echo within the gemstone. If it's got water in there, it tends to be of a higher quality, uh, so he's sorting them into two grades. He doesn't even need to open them up, his experience tells him, just from the sand, whether the crystal structure is going to be nice and what the colour is going to be like inside. It's just truly incredible. Such is the growing global demand for geodes, especially in China. 
that are here in Brazil. They're actually repairing and rebuilding and reconstituting geodes. They might look beautiful when you get them home, but actually a lot of them are completely rebuilt. The most humbling building in the town of Ametista do Sul is the Amethyst Church. Its very walls are lined with millions of amethyst gemstones, reminding the local community that much of their good fortune comes from the discovery of this incredible gemstone. We're in a wonderful church. It was only built about six years ago in Amethysta do Sol in Rio Grande do Sol. This is an incredible church. All of the walls are lined with low-grade amethyst. It's a magical place. It's a mystical place. I've got to say, this is one of the romantic, most romantic buildings I think I've ever been in. The next day, Matt Bennett travels to Auro Preto to discover more about a rare gem which is only found in one location. I'm here in the Capal Mine in, uh, in Minas Gerais in Brazil. This is where we get our Imperial Topaz. It's the only place in the world where we can get our Imperial Topaz. Gem expert Glenn Lehrer is here with me and his, here he is to tell you a little bit more about that beautiful gemstone. Okay, here we are at the original Capal Mine of the Imperial Topaz. If you can see right over my shoulder here, this was the original pit mine but, and it's been worked already but they also have to deal with what's called an artisanal well that's actually coming up from underneath. This particular pit, is, it looks like a shallow mine but it's actually already 40 meters deep where they originally were pulling out the topaz. This area is now completely mined out. The water itself is just natural flow from the underground art artesian well that you can see here. Up above is a new area over here where they're actually pulling the earth off of it. So it's a very labor intense. They have to first find the area where there's the topaz. Then they have to, which they have the three different surveys that they have to do before they actually determine where they're going to be starting the mining. Then once they know the area where the topaz is located, they then have to begin to clear a large area which they can step down to the actual area where they're going to find this topaz. Once they get to that lower area, that's when they can start to pull the topaz up. I was told on a really good day, if they're lucky, when they hit a specifically really good location, they stop all the heavy equipment that normally just pulls the earth in, throws it in the big heavy trucks to move it over to the washing plant that's over here on my left. And when they find a good area, a good location, they actually, the miners get out from the heavy equipment and shovel that particular location for the imperial topaz. On a good day, they say, they can get maybe three to four kilos. Now that sounds like a lot of topaz, but out of that three, four kilos, Maybe, maybe if they're lucky, only 5% is cuttable. So it gives you an immense appreciation for the amount of work it takes to get just down to that right gem that you might see sitting in some beautiful jewelry store in your local town or city. The next step of our journey takes us through the beautiful Iguazu Falls, reminding Steve about the beautiful natural colors of many Brazilian gemstones. We get many gemstones out of Brazil and it's hard to single two out. But here in front of the waterfalls, there's two that spring to mind, aquamarine and emerald. Beautiful aquamarines, very famous, of course, Brazil, Santa Maria, but it's not all about Santa Maria. You get some great, great, stunning uh, clarity, particularly with all of Brazil, uh, aquamarine. And then, of course, well, we talk about the emeralds. This is a country famed for its emeralds. You might people claim that Colombia is better or Zambia is better, but here, in uh, beautiful Brazil. The colors here are so reflective in the environment around us. From the lush greens of the Brazilian national parks to the most majestic of green gemstones, Steve travels to a working emerald mine to see why Brazil is the home of some of the world's finest emeralds. So how are emeralds formed in Brazil? Well, in many ways in different places. Right here in this mine, you've got the pegmatite. Now the pegmatite carries the beryllium. Beryllium, of course, is where we get beryl from. But you need a green uh, chemical, a green element to turn it green. Well, the green comes from the chromium in the host rock. So you've got the, the, the beautiful pegmatite, you've got the host rock, you've got your beryl, you've got your chromium. In the middle, a one in a million chance of finding a little bit of emerald. The actual rock in which the emerald grows in this particular mine in Brazil is very, very soft. If you look closely, I, I can break off pieces with my hand. It's a lot of biotite in here, a lot of talc. Uh, and because of that, because you can break it with your hand, imagine as the emerald grows in here, 
that it's not got as much pressure as if it was growing in quartz. So that reduction in pressure means that the crystals can grow much easier. They're not fighting with the environment around it as much as they are in many, many areas. So when you see some of my Brazilian emerald, when you see it that's got really nice clean crystals, really good diaphanity, and that is the reason. The reason is it's grown in a soft material, a soft rock that you can even break with your hands. After a brief visit, it's off to the home of Tourmaline and the main reason for our trip to Brazil. The surrounding area of São José de Safira is home to two of the most famous Tourmaline mines in the world, the Pedaneira and the Cruzeiro mines. We're in a quaint little Brazilian town, many, many miles from anywhere. In fact, we've travelled along 70 kilometres of dirt track. This is the first time that we've seen in a long, long time. San Jose de Safir, this little town. De Safir, of course, sapphire, precious gemstone. Although there's not been any precious gemstones found in the hills around here, that is the name. Don't ask me why, I haven't yet found out. But what we have found is beautiful tourmaline deposits. A couple bringing us blue tourmaline, uh, uh, red tourmaline, of course, rubellite, and some fabulous green tourmalines. Very beautiful countryside, very warm and friendly people, but the problem is trying to find the gemstones. They're all at altitude, they're all up in the hills, and bringing them down into the town where they're traded normally on a Friday is a job for a horse and a man. We've seen several riders as we've driven along uh, bringing their, their with, on their horse with their sacks across the back with the gemstone rocks uh, hanging off the back of the horses. They'll bring them into the local town, they'll get cleaned up, they'll get washed, and then they'll get traded on a Friday because that's the day they need the cash so they can feed the family. This is one of the most important mining areas in the world for tourmaline. We get indicolite from here, we get rubellite, and we get green tourmaline. The quality of the gemstones are amazing. The scenery is breathtaking. Even the houses are painted in all the different colours of tourmaline. The lengthy drive to the first of the two mines seems to really have taken its toll on Steve. Four hour drive to get this mark to this mine. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's bumpy. I am bruised. I'm sure when I take my shirt off, I'm bruised black and blue. Four hours drive through hilly, mountainous roads, dirt tracks to get here. But the scenery is fantastic. Let's go and see the mine and see what they're unearthing today. This is the Pedanera mine. Uh, it's way up high in the hillside. Uh, there's a railway track along the bottom which they use to actually get the gemstones out when they finish mining. Uh, the ventilation is all brought in by these big air tanks. Uh, and they've been mining here since about 1944. It's a fantastic mine. They've had uh, rubellite out of here, indicolite. Uh, they have had uh, some beautiful green tourmalines as well. In fact, every colour you can imagine for tourmaline. It's a fabulous, fabulous mine shaft uh, and one, that, one of the few that is still producing uh, today uh, inside of Brazil. So, KK, tell me about this new pocket you've just discovered. Yeah, this is, uh, we follow exactly like I said. Uh, we find the albite mm -hmm. and uh, the garnet and the black tourmaline. And then inside of those packets, there is some crystals. We never know what it is, if it is going to be pink, red, whatever it is. And uh, It's a bit like going to a casino, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For sure it is. You never know. Yeah. And earlier on you were saying quite often you'll drill through, and, and then if your drill goes straight through, you know you're into a, a big pocket. Yeah, this is what we, we hope. Usually when we drill, and uh, when you draw, mm -hmm. when one goes zip, you, you take it out, it's nothing. And then you make it another draw. So the air came, so the water goes zip. So you find a pocket. You never know what's going to be inside. Yeah. But uh, if you put it like this and you got some tourmaline in your hand, it is some tourmaline there. Wow. But uh, you, we don't know what know. kind and uh, how many kilos, how clean. It is another, your heart beats like this, you know. You have uh, <laughs> to open and see. If uh, you find really something, and uh, we're very happy with this mine. We've yeah. been fine here lately, uh, quantity. Excellent. It's very difficult to find uh, blue tourmaline. Uh, we're inside a big pegmatite that was uh, pushed up to the surface of the earth with a volcanic action many, many millions of years ago. It's very, very hard rock indeed. We're some 150 metres below uh, the surface of the earth here uh, and some 200 metres inside the tunnel. And yet, when you talk about blue tourmaline, they're literally bringing out one or two pieces a week. It's incredibly rare. And the sizes are normally very, very small. So to find a three, four carat piece, we're talking months. We're talking you know, a long, long time. 
In fact, over the last couple of years, they've only had one piece come out over five carats. So your blue tourmaline for mines like this, very, very rare. People talk about tanzanite being rare. You're talking about a different league altogether. Blue tourmaline, hard to find, gorgeous to look at, great, great depth of colour, very durable gemstone, and very, very hard in harsh mining conditions. Keke, a lot of your blue tourmaline has really good uh, clarity. I mean, a lot of the, the blue tourmaline on the market recently is heavily included, but some coming through your mind seems to be you know, nice and clean. What, is, that, is that geological or...? No, the thing is this. Uh, usually, was a lot of tourmaline with inclusion was not sell. Then those Chinese come in the market and they buy everything. So everybody that has this material that uh, didn't sell like uh, 10 years ago, now they put everything on the market. Ah, uh, okay. Usually, uh, tumulin has to be 100% clean so you can heat, yeah. put in the oven, yeah. and goes like 600. Yeah. If I have any defect, you cannot heat. Mm -hmm. But the, the bicolor, one day uh, pink, kind of brown, yeah. and blue with some uh, white, yeah. they can be clean. Right. But when they red and green, no, they never clean. Interesting. So the rubellite and the blue, never. And the, uh, we recently bought from you uh, some uh, beautiful bicolor with the, the green and the pink. Was that actually from this mine? Yeah, is that from this mine, uh, like uh, 100 meters back wow. there, okay. 80 meters, I don't know exactly. And how often do you come across the, the bicolor, is it? Yeah, it's not that uh, easy. When we find some pocket, it is a lot of small pocket. It likes this side. This has this small pocket mm -hmm. here. They have another one there. They have a lot of small one. Sometimes we find a big pocket with a lot of low material. In a small one like this, they have a one or two specimen that's more money than the whole pocket. Well. <laughs> so you never know. Yeah. This is a... That's Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Like That's why you enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. I spoke to a lot of miners in Madagascar, and they say that it's the hope and the dream that keeps them going. And they, I said, they say that they don't earn that much more than if they were farming, but at least they've got the dream and the, the hope that one day they hit the big pocket. Yeah. You see, in my case, in my age, uh, this is making me feel very good. When I go on a bed, I dream, I, I lost my. You know, I'm not filled to sleep, so I begin to dream. I'm going to drill this. I'm going to find a big pocket. That, that makes me feel yeah. much better in dream. So, you know, Excellent. I keep dreaming. Excellent. Yeah. As someone who likes to get stuck in, Steve can't resist the chance of picking up a shovel and having a go at mining himself. Well, mining is quite hard. It's quite rewarding. When you see those little pieces that you get, if we just get one piece out of here, just... A one, two carat by colour tourmaline, it'd be worth it. But we never know. KK, who owns the mine, tells me that if we get one carat here, then that's probably about all we will see. Don't forget, they've had to tunnel to get down here. Then they've had to blast to break up the bits with a hammer. So this is just really the easy bit. This is just loading it up into the cart to, to take it up to the surface, uh, where we'll then wash it and see if we've found any. What KK has said to me is because I'm helping out, that he'll do me an extra special deal if we find a piece today. But it's been a couple of days without a single gemstone, so who knows? So, so exciting now. I've got to be careful I don't let this go and run over the cameraman because there's a lot of weight. But we're going back down there. Oh. Oh. A little bit of an inexperienced minor action there. I thought what I thought was the, the brake to slow it down uh, actually opens up the front and it's let a lot of at the front. So we're going to have to put it all back in. Miner's not overly happy with me, but the, I thought that the, the cart was slipping away from me and I thought it was the brake. So I pulled it and it actually opened everything up onto the track. Hey, it's just going to delay us by about half an hour. So we've blasted, we've chipped, we've cracked. We've hammered, we've chiseled all day long. And this is the final bit. Uh, I'm not pushing this up, it might look like I'm, I'm actually being pulled up by it because this is a real steep incline, about 45 degrees. So trust me, I'm not pushing this. It is pulling me up. When we get to the top, we're going to wash it. And KK owns the mine, owns this particular mine, says to me, Steve, if we get one carrot out of this one today, then we've had a good day. That's how rare gemstones are.
After a short journey, we finally arrive at the Cruzeiro mine, which due to the fabulous quality found here, has become synonymous with the word rubellite. I'm in Minas Gerais at the Cruzeiro mine, very famous mine indeed when it comes to beautiful rubellites, beautiful tourmalines. The word is also very famous in Brazil because it's the name of their old currency. It's also a constellation you can see in the night sky down here, also the name of the cruise ship and their old currency. So it has many, many meanings, but in the terms of gemstones, it means two things. It means great clarity, great quality, some of the best you're gonna see in tourmaline from Brazil. I put in there a mine as it yesterday. Uh, this one's going deep underground. We're using the uh, tracks, the trucks to actually along the track to bring out uh, the gemstones. Here they were looking for the multicolored gemstones. If you've ever got a multicolored tourmaline piece of jewelry from us and the clarity is really good and it says Brazil on your certificate, the chances are it's come from this mine. Uh, although <laughs> the water's a little bit muddy and getting into the mine can be a bit of a hassle, the quality is, is world class. And that is because that when the gemstones were forming, there wasn't any uh, earthquakes for thousands and thousands of years. They, they lay really tranquil uh, here in Brazil. Uh, and that is why that you don't see that many sort of inclusions and cracks and crevices within the gemstones. Fine quality gems right from this little mine here. It was quite nice walking down the tunnel, but then we come to this bit and there's miners working right down the bottom here. There's, I've counted about 11 sets of ladders coming up and uh, they don't have to haul the, the loose rock up because they've got this little conveyor belt system here to do that. But imagine going up and down here every day uh, to get the gemstones. And this is the extent that we have to go to because all the easy pickings have gone now. They've taken the rubellite from the top of the earth. They've taken the easy to get hold of stones and we're going deeper and deeper. And there's two problems with that. It costs more and more because you're having to extravate a lot more uh, rock. But also the deeper you get, the less you find. So again, costs are going up on many, many gemstones and in particular the rubellite from this mine. This little bit of tourmaline here is not of gem quality, you can see it's actually breaking up with my fingers as I, as I touch it. But it's a good indication that just above here we're going to find more green tourmaline. In fact, KK actually said to me that uh, when you find green, there's a chance you'll find green above. When you find trace elements of pink, it means that the, the right chemical elements are in the rock, so there's a chance that there'll be other pink around. So even though you're finding bits right now that aren't gem quality, it does mean that there's a good chance within a metre or two of here, if we blast a little bit further today, we might find some more gemstones. A lot of people ask me what's the difference between pink tourmaline and rubellite. Well, it depends on what the, the crystal is like before we start cutting it. Because obviously with, with many gemstones, the more you cut, the smaller the pieces get, the lighter the colour. Like tanzanite, tanzanite reduces massively as you get smaller pieces. Same with ruby and rubellite. So with rubellite, as we cut it, it will become pink tourmaline in, in look. But we have to think about the crystal when we're cutting it. So quite often you'll end up looking at a piece of home and going, oh, it looks more like pink tourmaline, but we've called it rubellite. And the reason is it is rubellite because it was rubellite when it came out of the ground, it only took on a pink appearance as we started to make the crystals smaller as we start to facet the material. We've just been mining for uh, rubellite today and pink tourmaline. And tell me if I'm doing this right or wrong. Is that good? More round. In the water. Faster. Wow! Yeah, one little piece there, look. Yeah, just one little piece. Yeah. Because this is, uh, see? Yeah, nice. You have to put in the acid. Yeah, you know, yeah that's it to take the, the last yeah, bits off. There's a lot of stone inside, too. Yeah. Excellent. Douglas, thank you very much. After leaving the mine, Steve had a chance to chat with Glenn Lehrer and GIA photographer Rob Weldon about why they think Cruzeiro rubellite is such a special gemstone. So the Cruzeiro mine, what do you know about it then, buddy? Well, for me, I knew it years ago when I was able to get some of the rough. It's some of the deepest rubellite you can find. It's that really deep, almost grapey Merlot colour yeah. of grape. It's rich, it's deep. You have to be careful when you cut it because sometimes it will darken it too dark for you. So sometimes I like the smaller, medium-sized stones because that's where the color really comes through and you can see the richness. And what's it like to photograph? Is really like an easy stone to photograph? Or? It can be challenging at times uh, uh, as a mineral specimen. What's interesting about it is to get the striations in the crystal faces which these uh, minerals have in spades. They're just beautifully terminated. You want to get it um, as close as possible to what you're seeing when you hold a crystal in your hand and you turn it and you examine it under different kinds of light. 
really for the photographer that's the challenge to try to synthesize yeah. all of those lighting conditions yeah. in a single two-dimensional photograph so it's not only difficult mining it it's difficult cutting it it's difficult to photograph it <laughs> and it's difficult to find it so when you get hold of it get it just buy it <laughs> <laughs> Our journey to Brazil is over. Along the way, we've met many interesting people and visited the most important tourmaline deposits in the world. But we've really only scratched the surface of what Brazil has to offer. So, please join us on our next gemstone adventure. <laughs>